Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. This is the live office hours for the School of Sweet Georgia. My name is Felicia Lowe from Sweet Georgia and the School of Sweet Georgia. And we come here every month, the last Thursday of every month at 10 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. And we just talk about what's been happening inside the school. We catch up about what projects you guys have all been working on and everything like that. It's just a really nice time for us to sit down and chat about what's been happening this past month. So wonderful to see you guys all in the chat here as well. Now, these sessions are recorded. So if you do need to go or need to leave halfway through, that's totally fine. They are going to be posted inside the school so you can watch them later. And then if you are finding these later and you want to actually participate in the chat, we do send out an email um, ahead of time. And it's also posted in our calendar on the School of Sweet Georgia so that you can find the link. These links are unlisted links on YouTube and you can find the link to join us for the chat when these sessions actually happen. So really, really exciting to be here. I don't know if you can tell, it's very <laughs> sunny, very, very sunny here. We were away for like two weeks for spring break with the kids and doing all sorts of activities. And it was almost as soon as we got back, it just became sunny. It was blue sky every day. It's been cloudless skies. It's been quite amazing. And I think that maybe that sunshine has made me feel really like spring cleaning. <laughs> I don't know if this is happening to you at all, but I'm here in the studio today, this morning to do this, and then I'm gonna clean the studio for the rest of the day in preparation for some filming that's gonna start happening in this, uh, this month. We are gonna be filming three days with Amanda Wood, who is our rigid heddle instructor here for weaving. And so we're gonna be filming something that you guys have all been waiting for for some time. It's two heddles on a rigid heddle loom. And then at the end of this month, we also have Tabitha Hedrick, who's gonna be coming up from Tennessee. She's flying all the way from Tennessee to Canada and we are going to film with her. We're going to film two at a time socks and uh, a bunch of other things as well. So really, really excited about that. So hope everybody is doing well today. Um, let me get into the stuff that we have prepared. So this is what we are going to talk about um, today. And this is basically following a similar sort of structure and plan as we did last time, just talking about the things that are Right now, very top of mind, what's going, what's been going on. Um, we're going to talk about the latest updates in the school. We're going to talk about upcoming events and things um, as well, talking about the community forums. And then the majority of these sessions are really an opportunity for us to share what you guys have been making inside the school. So it is absolutely phenomenal. Every month I come and I say, it's amazing all the projects that you guys have made, but it's amazing all of these projects and like looking at the skills and things that you've learned inside the school and where you take them and beyond. And so really, really excited to share all of those things with you. So talking about what is top of mind. Now, one of the things has been cleaning, cleaning and spring cleaning and all these things. But one of the things has been sort of, um, it's kind of come from our January discussion about, you know, organizing your space, organizing your time. And then last month we talked also about time blocking um, and time blocking. There's a whole discussion in the uh, forums about it, but there's also a blog post that Robin, one of our uh, School of Sweet Georgia moderators wrote. And it was all about where to find time for making things and specifically blocking out chunks of time ahead of time, like creating an ideal week schedule, all of these kinds of things. Now, out of that whole conversation came the idea, well, how difficult would it be to actually make sure that you do at least 15 minutes a day? Because that's very often like a good, nice goal to have. Just 15, 10, 15 minutes a day. Can you fit 10 or 15 minutes of consistent crafting into your schedule? Um, if you have heard of Jerry Seinfeld has this, this practice where I think he would write every single day. He would write new material every single day. And um, every day that he wrote new material, he would make a big X on his calendar. And so the goal was to have like an X on every single day to um, ensure that you were consistently practicing your creativity, practicing your craft. And so uh, how easy would it be to actually track that? And so I downloaded, I thought, oh, I'm going to design my own habit tracker. But then no, I just went and I found one on <laughs> Google. And this one you can get from evermoreparco.com. So it's free download. You can download the PDF and print it off. And I just stuck it to my fridge. And 
I actually wanted to track the breakdown of all the different habits. So breakdown of like, did I actually spend any time weaving, any time spinning, working on the CSM versus a the flatbed knitting machine? Did I hand knit? Did I crochet? Did I go for a walk? Which were the days that I was skiing? And did I spend any time hand finishing in the evening? So I tried to break it down by actual craft. And then I found at a certain point in time, it was okay. It was easy to get the check mark. Check marks were okay. But then I didn't have any sense of how much time I was spending on everything. And so then I started to track it in the time tracking app that I talked about on um, Taking Back Friday last month. I was using ClickUp to track a lot of my time. Um, and so I've made like a number of observations about sort of how this has worked for me. I know that on our team, I believe Charlotte, uh, Greta, Vicky, Robin, Leah, I think that a whole bunch of us were also trying to do the same challenge. Can we do 15 minutes a day of crafting for 30 days? And everyone had different um, sort of observations about their experience. And so I'm going to talk about that more in the next Taking Back Friday. But I would be really interested to see if you guys could do this as well. So if you were to track doing 15 minutes a day for 30 days, how would you do it? How would it feel? What experience would you get out of that? What observations could you make? And then if there is um, any tips that you would like for improving how you do your habits or like creating good habits and being able to follow through with your habits. One of the books that I always recommend is called Atomic Habits, written by James Clear. It came out maybe two years ago, and it was amazing. For, for one Christmas, I think I, I gave this book to a whole bunch of people. <laughs> Atomic Habits. It's a great book. But they also have a free download, which is a PDF uh, of a cheat sheet of how you can improve your habits and how you can set put good habits in place and then kind of remove bad habits from your daily practice and all that kind of stuff. So we're going to talk about this some more, but this is something that has definitely been at the forefront of what we've been doing lately. Now, we also received a question. So you guys will know that you are more than welcome to submit questions to us ahead of time before the live office hours. We can talk about your questions. Um, and uh, so we have a question from Louise. Louise is actually in the chat today. So hello. Um, and she asked a question about dying. She asked a question last month about dying as well. And so I believe she's doing a lot of dying right now. And her question is, I've been thinking about this. When you are creating all of your beautiful colors, are they all made from CMY, which is cyan, magenta, and yellow, or RYB, or it's red, yellow, and blue? Or do you purchase other dye powders in different colors or shades to create more variants? Thank you. So that's a question from Louise. Now, years and years and years ago, when I started dyeing in like 2005, 2006, um, I did purchase other sorry, dye powders from these manufacturers. So there's a number of different dye manufacturers and they make pure colors, which are like pure pigments, pure colors. You'll be able to find the list, which ones are pure colors. And then they have all sorts of sort of trend colors or colors that they've mixed together from the powders in order to create other colors. Now, I feel like part of the reason why they do that is to create more variety, more inventory. Um, they can follow trends. They can make it easier for people to dye trend colors and things like that. Um, and it just gives them just novelty, seasonal changes in color and all that kind of stuff, bring people back to get the next new fresh trend dye color. I feel like what we are teaching within the school is very much dyeing things from pure colors, from pure primaries, taking those pure primaries and mixing the them together as dye stock solutions and then creating formulas and blends and mixes from there. What we do is we really just invest in pure colors and then create what we call premixes. So we take those pure colors, we mix them into dye stock solutions, then we mix those pure colors together and create our own dye formulas from those pure colors. Then using those colors that have been blended together, um, those are our like premixes. And then out of those ones, that's what we use to mix and combine to create all of our other dye colors. So part of the reason for this is that um, I don't like investing in dye powders that may or may not be there later on. Um, that's one, because they're seasonal, maybe they're novelty, maybe they will get discontinued. So I don't know how long they're going to last. The other thing is that sometimes the 
dyes, as they are being blended together in a powder, um, when you go to try to dissolve those dyes, they don't necessarily all dissolve at the same rate. And so sometimes I have found that some of the dye colors will dissolve first and others will be left behind. And there's a little bit of like undissolved dye in that situation. And then when you go to apply it to your yarn, then um, there's inconsistencies in the application. So I feel like I would like to dissolve everything down into a dye stock solution first so that it's, I know it's homogeneous. I know that it's all mixed. I know that it's completely, completely dissolved. And then I get the consistency of color application. That's what I'm looking for. Um, so it's a couple of those kinds of reasons. And yeah, I think it's also just more economical for us to invest in pure colors and then mix from there. Because then every single color is possible from what we're mixing together um, rather than trying to play with things that have already been pre-mixed. There's just more control, I feel like, at our end. Um, so I'm just trying to follow up with your chat and say... Um, Yes. Waiting for the kettle to boil and tea to steep is perfect spinning time. Very nice. Yes. Um, yeah. So I think it's very much about just trying to create more consistent colors from uh, colors that we can trust because they're pure pigments. I hope that answers your question. I'd love to hear sort of like the flip side conversation. If, if anybody really enjoys investing in those um, sort of pre-mixed dye colors that you can get from dye companies. They are fun. And very often they'll create them, you know, in the shade of all the Pantone colors for the season or whatever it is. Um, and it's really nice that it's ready to go. I just feel like it's less consistent than I'd like. So that is the question that we have for today. Feel free to email your questions in, in the future if you guys want to um, ask anything else for, about these things. So these are the latest updates. We're going to talk about what's been happening inside the school. In terms of classes, this March, we released the Spinning with an E-Spinner class with Debbie Hell. This has been like long awaited. We first, we were supposed to film this during the pandemic and then that didn't happen. And so after, after a while, after things were, you know, lightened up and safe to travel, then Debbie came out to Vancouver and we refilmed the entire course spinning with an e-spinner and you can see in the class we tested a bunch of different e-spinners so this one happens to be the eew uh, this is the one that i have it's not the brand new one i think that just came out but this is the eew from dreaming robots this is an ashford e-spinner three there is also a dreaming robots nano and this is debbie's daedalus daedalus um e-spinner i think it's called the magpie i'm not quite sure I can't remember exactly which one this was, but it's one of the Daedalus ones and it's lovely. It's an amazing e-spinner. And so we had the opportunity to put them all side by side. There was also one more. We also got um, a Hanson and we compared all of these different e-spinners in terms of how they sound, how fast they go, all sorts of different aspects. Um, and then just talking about how to set one up and how to use one. I feel like it's become very, very popular recently. The EEW6, like Elena is saying that that's an EEW6. Um, yeah, they've become very, very popular. Lots of people picking up new ones, um, playing with e-spinners for lots of reasons. E-spinners are really popular right now. Starling. Thank you, Loreline. <laughs> Fantastic. So if you have not yet had a chance to watch that, I would really, really encourage you to check out that video about the e-spinners. Um, as well, in April, we have the next segment of Rachel's luxury spinning class, and that's going to be about camelids. So that's coming out next. We have Granny Squares with Charlotte, which is coming out next. And Charlotte has done like a number of different projects with granny squares. We're also going to do sort of like a series of crochet videos on YouTube, all about crochet as well. Um, in May, we have another lecture with Laura Fry, and this one is going to be on twills, but twills beyond four shafts. So I believe, I believe Laura has a 16 shaft loom, maybe more maybe more, but she'll talk about that. And then um, with Charlotte, we have another video coming out about dyeing fiber. And it's this dyeing fiber in larger quantities, like, you know, pounds and pounds of fiber <laughs> and how to, um, how to handle a lot of larger volumes of dyeing ergonomically so that you don't injure yourself and things like that. I know that, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if you've ever tried to dye a sweater's worth of yarn, but once you have all of your fiber in the pot and then you add a ton of water to the pot in order to do solid shade dyeing that pot could be you know more than 50 pounds 60 pounds of 
of pot and how do you handle that without, you know, hurting yourself. And so there's a lot of dyeing content that we are putting out with Charlotte and it's all about sort of the ergonomics of dyeing larger quantities. Um, in June, we are also doing uh, spinning textured yarn. So sometimes they're called art yarns. We call them textured yarns, but these are things like beehives and coils and slub yarns and things like that. And it's really about getting a lot of control, your hand movements, control over your hand movements in order to create these textured yarns. And so Debbie's going to do that um, also with a wheel and an e-spinner. And then finally, we are going to have the two heddles on Rigid Heddle with Amanda Wood, which we are filming starting next Tuesday here at the studio. That is going to be coming very soon. So thank you so much for making these suggestions for what you want to see um, in the school. Uh, I'm going to talk about that in a second too here. So yes, <laughs> here is the link for the new member survey for 2023. I know that we have a survey that we um, invite all members of the school to fill out at the very beginning. Once you join the school, one of the first things we ask you to do is to go fill out this member survey. And then... Um, and then we send you to the, the dashboard of your school and the link to the surveys there as well. However, if you have not filled out a survey in the past two weeks, <laughs> then please, please, please come and uh, go to this link and fill out a new survey for us so that we can plan for the future. So we have made a ton of the classes that members have asked for already. Um, and now we're just looking at, well, what should we be doing next? What, where do we want to follow these rabbit holes? So there's a ton of different sort of topics that I've put down here, but basically because I'm breaking them out um, into more and more fine grained topics. So things like, well, we're doing crochet, design for spinning, I'm sorry, design for weaving, design for knitting. There is all different kinds of dyeing. So there's dyeing. I also put natural dyeing. Um, people have mentioned embroidery a number of times. So embroidery keeps coming up, felting, knitting, um, machine knitting. I know there's a couple of people in the school who are into machine knitting now, flatbed machine knitting punch needle, um, quilting and sewing. These are more fabric arts, but I'm just interested to hear about what people's interests are. So a lot of these things are on here and then splitting out weaving with multi-shaft weaving, like on looms, floor looms, table looms versus with rigid heddle, because they are very, very different. In fact, they've become so different and so obviously different that I actually broke them out in the um, school menu. So like if you go to the main menu under the learn menu, rather than having everything under weaving now, they are split up into tapestry, rigid heddle weaving, and uh, multi-shaft loom weaving. So they're all different now. There's another question that I really, really want to sort of um, send people to, and this is uh, the what community features we can help build. So one of the things that we have done in the past is we have done study groups, which run for a sh like a, a segment of time. There's a window of time that these run for, um, and then the cohort is done, and you can continue to do this you know, this, this study topic, if you like, but sort of the conversations around those kind of like ends after a certain amount of time. Same with the make-alongs. We also have the community forums for the school. We have chat on discord. We have these zoom based meetups every month. Um, we have the, I don't know how you feel about the idea of in-person meetups. I don't know how possible it would be for us to do this because we have members from all over the world. So maybe it is organizing locally. This is all ideas that we're having. We're working on the project in photo galleries. There's also sort of like more uh, sort of friend features inside the school that we could add. Um, and, and also making a directory. Would that be helpful for you? Making a marketplace for handmade goods for things that have been made by members. Would this be helpful for you? Um, and then a marketplace for digital goods. Like if members were to create their own patterns and want to share and distribute those, would that be useful for you? So there's a lot of questions that um, we have just really wanting to hear what the members are interested in. So that way we can help create those things. So one of the things that we've talked about for a while now is this idea of the photo gallery. And so I finally, <laughs> we finally made it available for you to hopefully see. And so if you go into the community section of the school, there is going to be a new tab now. And so it's under the tab create, and then you'll be able to see two things. You'll be able to see a gallery link and also a photos link. There's also a downloads link, but that's not going to show up for you yet. I'm going to talk about that in a second. 
But the gallery one is one where you can start to create your own photo albums um, within a topic. So if you say went to like the crochet gallery, you could create your own album of your crochet projects. And I think having these albums is nice because it kind of like separates them out per member. So if you want, you could create your own crochet album, you could cro create a knitting album, a spinning album. And so when you go and click this photo, uh, this, sorry, this button here that says add images. It's a big green button that says add images. It will give you this prompt. So you can choose to use an album. So by creating a new album or by continue, uh, continuing without an album, um, I know that some people have been posting already without albums, um, or you can choose to add to an existing album. So I have created an album in, you might yeah, you should be able to see it. But under my profile, I've created two albums. One of them is just for my twill gamp stuff. And the other one is for weaving. And so all of my weaving stuff is under um, that gallery now. And so I just encourage you guys to try play around with this and try adding your own images. Um, it's just nice to see what everybody's been working on. Now, I know that everybody's been posting photos within their forum posts, which is great. A lot of in-process photos, but I feel like the albums in these galleries, this is a really good place to put your finished objects, kind of like a final look at all of these things. And in the description, <clears throat> you can always link to all the posts where you've written about the progress, the, the journey and all of that kind of stuff and how you've pulled it all together. So um, just really excited to see everybody start to create these galleries. Now, these gallery topics or these main categories are, uh, j I, I just made a few just to get us started. But if you feel like there are any that are missing, that you feel like, oh, you know, you didn't make a space for my punch needle projects, then just message me and let me know. And we continue to evolve and add as this all goes. Wonderful. So that is the start of that. Now I did mention the thing about the downloads. And so this is something that I am still um, working on. This is an idea that we've been talking about, but um, having the weaving draft files available for people to download more easily. So I know that inside the school courses, like the, the cabin blanket is part of the double weave course. So if you go to the double weave on four shafts course, you'll be able to download the PDF where you get the cabin blanket project. Now, there's a project in here called the Dornick Twill Towels. These are some towels that I made for my family and my friends for Christmas a couple of years ago. And um, these ones don't have a written pattern to go with them. You don't really need a written pattern to go with them. But I did create a WIF file, like a weaving um, exchange file. And so that's something that you can pop into your weaving software. And then you can sort of manipulate it and change it and do whatever you like with it, change the colors, whatever you want to do. Um, but just to have a place to exchange those kinds of files could be really helpful, especially as we get into more and more different projects. Rather than writing a PDF pattern for every single project, sometimes all you need is the WIF file. So that's something that I'm kind of like working on and exploring and seeing if this would be a good idea or not. So I'm happy to hear any feedback that anybody has about this. Uh, yeah. So for the coming events, this is what's going to be going on for next month. We have also in April, um, the knitting meetups with Robin. So she has two that are going to be happening. They are usually on Mondays. And then we have a weaving and spinning meetup with Vicky. And then we have as well the Taking Back Friday live stream that happens here on Fridays. And um, it's the second Friday of every month. And we're going to be talking about that sort of 15 minutes a day of crafting and getting into the habit of making things. And then as well, the last Thursday of every month, we're doing the live office hours. And so that's what is happening in April. In May, we're going to have that additional event with the live lecture with Laura Fry. So this is just a quick reminder to join us on the community forums. A lot of discussions have been happening lately. A lot of new members coming in and introducing themselves. Just a lot of great activity. So would love to see you in here. A lot of great discussions. And I'm going to highlight them in the, um, the share your win section because, uh, yeah, there's a lot of really good conversations that are happening in there. A lot of help being given. 
Um, and as well, if you haven't heard, we do have this Discord chat that's been going on as well. Um, yeah, there's a lot of great conversation, really chatty conversation that's been happening inside the Discord as well. So um, it's it's great to see everybody's projects and what everyone's been making and all sorts of things like that. And so this is just kind of like another uh, venue if you want to connect with either people inside the school or people in the larger Sweet Georgia community. So there's a little bit of information here about how to join the Discord and then specifically if you are a member of the school, how you can connect your school account to your Discord account so that you can be identified as a school member inside the Discord. So that is a little bit of that. Feel free to ask me questions if you have questions about the community or the Discord. Inside the community, we do have two amazing moderators, Robin and Vicky, who are there every day answering questions, helping to direct, um, you know, questions to instructors and so all sorts of things like that. So they're very, very encouraging and, um, and active in there. So uh, welcome you guys to chat in there as well. So let's talk about the things that you guys have been making. This is really cool. Okay. So we have had uh, Charlotte, who is our assistant production manager. Everybody knows Charlotte does more than that. Charlotte's been doing lots and lots of things. She's been crocheting since grade nine. And um, if you've ever met her in person, you might see like she'll have full length, full dress made from crochet. She's, yeah loves crochet. And so from the very beginning, she's created crochet classes for us that start at the absolute basics, how to make a chain stitch. And then it was how to do single crochet and double crochet. Now this recent course that's come out has been about how to do increases and decreases in crochet. And so this is Kathleen did some of the exercises in Charlotte's crochet class to show the the shape that is created by doing different kinds of increases and decreases. It's quite amazing. I think it's all math, uh, but you can see the difference in the angle from this kind of increase to this kind of increase, all the changes that can be made. And so she said, Charlotte, what a great exercise you can really see and therefore understand how the shape changes according to how you increase and or decrease. And so these are the different decreases and increases that she's done. And then you can find this topic where she's share these photos here. And then also the course, if you are interested in learning sort of how to shape your crochet, then this is the course that you definitely want to go to. So I encourage you guys to check that out. If you are wanting to learn crochet, the next thing is Shuin's cowl, which is also a pattern that was highlighted in Charlotte's crochet class. So this, again, in order to create these ripples and waves of uh, texture and pattern, it's just like a knitting. And when you want to knit lace and you want to make, say, like a, you know, what what is the name of this lace in, in knitting again? Old shale, but it, there's another word for it. Fe feather and fan. <laughs> oh, my memory is so bad now. Um, yeah, so feather and fan is like a whole bunch of increases and then a whole bunch of decreases and a whole bunch of increases and a whole bunch of decreases. Yeah, you have to do that in crochet as well. So it's a whole bunch of increases and a whole bunch of decreases. But how do you do that in crochet? And so that is what she talks about in this class as well. So this one, Shuin actually um, crocheted the cowl, which is called a Yona cowl. And she did this using a fingering weight sock yarn from Polka Dot Creek. Um, and she, at first, she sort of... Uh, put the colors in one specific order, but then there wasn't enough contrast between uh, the different colors, the contrast of value. And we talked about that on one of the Taking Back Friday videos about contrast of value. And so, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and so just by her rearranging the position of these five mini skeins, all these five colors, she was able to bring out more boldness out of her cowl colors. And so um, she said, after frogging the pattern, frogging the project and rearranging some of the colors, I like the color contrast a lot more with alternating light colors and darker colors. And so this turned out really, really beautiful. So if you go to this link, you'll be able to see actual photos of her wearing it. Um, it's just really, really lovely. But I wanted to show this photo because it shows the progression of those five different colors and how you organize them. It's a beautiful job. Thank you so much for sharing. Now we have here 
uh, Andrea. Andrea, if you follow her learning plan, she's been doing a ton of things. In fact, we are currently on looking at Andrea's learning plan page 10. Um, this is this is how much stuff she has been working on making and building and everything. And so she recently acquired a EEW6, Dreaming Robots e-spinner, but this one was not brand new. She got this one, I think, um, barely used, I'm pretty sure. Um, but yeah, it's 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 wonderful to see her sort of uh, playing with this. And this is just the very first singles that she started to spin. If you go to her learning plan, you'll see that she's already finished two complete bobbins out of this. And so just doing a lot more spinning now and making that happen with an e-spinner. It's fantastic. If you are interested in seeing more about the Dreaming Robots e-spinner, this is the link to the Dreaming Robots website to find that as well. We have Alyssa spinning as well. So this is, from what I read and understand, this is Alyssa spinning where she spun all the singles using a supported spindle. And then she plied these together using her Dreaming Robots Nano. And so that's like a tiny little um, e-spinner that actually people love and it works and it goes. And so she's done that to uh, apply these two singles together. And so you can find more about that with here. And again, if you want to find that e-spinning course, it's right here as well. We're going to talk about spinning. There's a lot of spinning stuff here. <laughs> um, this is Joni has, you, you should come and watch her, um, her, her, her thread here. But this is basically um, her yarn where she wanted to make a three ply yarn in a gradient. Um, and it's 600 yards of yarn on this nitty knotty, which she said probably is not a great idea. She it kind of got tangled and she had some trouble with it, but it's a gorgeous photo and a gorgeous gradient um, and just beautiful hand spinning. Like it just looks so smooth and consistent and even really, really, really lovely. I believe this is all chain plied, which is, yeah, beautiful. Like you don't see any, any bubbles or knots of inconsistency. It just like all the yarn looks really nice and smooth and consistent. So that's going to make a lovely pair of socks if that's what she's going to make with it. Um, we have more spinning for socks here. This is also spun from hand dyed fiber um, into three ply sock yarn. And so this is Melissa from her learning plan. Melissa had listed she Topic A is she wanted to learn how to spin for socks. And she said, I want to try different fibers and all the different yarn construction in Rachel's class. There's a lot of different ways to make sock yarn, not just a traditional three ply yarn. Um, there's lots of different ways of mixing and blending different plies, different twists, so that you can create yarn that has different bounce, different spring, um, different feel to it. So uh, there's a lot of things to try and explore. Um, and also she wanted to play with sort of colors and how to mix colors and how to pull out the colors and make them stripe and all sorts of things like that. So if you follow Melissa's learning plan, you'll see the fiber um, that was dyed and how she stripped it and then how she spun it into singles and everything like that. It's really, really fun. And I just love these colors. They just make you really happy. <laughs> if you want to check out Rachel's class, it is here as well. And then we have here, this is Linda has also been working on spinning for socks. And so this is a sort of a, a, a note card that she's created for herself because she is spinning her sock yarn on an e-spinner. You can see it's kind of like dangling from her e-spinner here. And so she's tracking things like RPM um, in order to figure out what her settings are for her e-spinner so that she can spin a consistent yarn. So she says, I've been spinning quite a bit of yarn to knit into socks, but so far each one was not quite what I wanted. I, I would get a yarn that's a little bit rough and did not have enough bounce or stretch. And so I'm getting the right wraps per inch, but the feel is hard to get right. And so um, you can follow this link and there's a really good discussion about the things that people are looking for in order to sort of replicate commercial sock yarn. It's not just about the wraps per inch, but it's also about twist per inch. It's also about twist angle. Twist angle, if it's too hard, can make it feel wiry, can make your yarn feel like uh, just hard and wiry. Uh, yeah, but you need a high twist angle in order to build strength. So there's a lot of different things to consider. So that whole conversation is happening here at Sock Yarn, who is the boss? <laughs> 
So now we move into a lot of the weaving projects. Now, this is Bridget's, she said, the second project off my table loom. Um, and uh, she said she wove first. Okay, so this is from the class that's called Multi-Shaft Weaving Basics. And so this was all about, you know, playing with different kinds of twills for the first time, looking at a four shaft loom, what can you do? And it's just experimenting and just playing. And so the way that I had built that first sampler was, you know, with a number of different kinds of colors, then you test a bunch of different kinds of treadling patterns and things like that. Um, and so because Bridget was just getting started and she didn't want to put on a very wide warp, she said, because I was a little bit too intimidated to try a wider warp, she just made these um, mug rugs. So she did a narrower warp using 3-2 cotton, which is like beam 3-2 cotton. And um, then she used some sock yarn for weft and made these little mug rugs. So, so, so cute. And so each mug rug is a different twill pattern and she decided which one she liked best. And then she used that to extrapolate out and make a much bigger scarf project. So this, um, this scarf project it doesn't look like a scarf from my cropping of the photo, but it's much bigger. It's much bigger. I only showed just the texture of one part, but you can see that she chose this mug rug and she liked that. And so therefore she translated that over into uh, her actual project. So I think that this is a really, really great way to adapt a larger sample and just make it something that you feel comfortable doing. And all of these things are just guidelines. They're just here for you to try and play and see what you like. So I'm so, so glad that you got started with all of this. It's fantastic. So um, yeah, the course for the multi-shaft weaving basics is there as well. Now this next one is really interesting. <clears throat> we did a class last year, last year, no, a year and a half ago, <laughs> called Twill twill on four shafts. So twill gamps, we were weaving twill gamps. And um, originally in that project, I wove it with the beam, just beam three, two cotton. So it was a uh, quite like, um, I also wove it at a number of different sets because I was trying to feel and test how does this fabric feel? How does it feel too dense? Does it feel too hard? Does it feel drapey? All of these questions. And so Nina also wove these twill gamps, but she used eight, two cotton, which is much finer. And she also tried it at two different sets. Um, and so you can see she's got a light green color, like a yellowish light green color for warp. And then for weft, she was using kind of like a darker green color, maybe like a mid-tone green uh, color here. Now, these are two different sets. One of them is going to be a little bit lighter, looser, more drapey than the other. The one on the right hand is going to be a little bit more firm, but you can see if you squint your eyes a little bit, the overall color of the right gamp is more light, more yellow than the one on the left. Let me know if you can see that as well. <laughs> but the one on the right here is a little bit more warp faced because it's set at a tighter set all of the threads the warp threads are a little bit closer together and so the color of those warp threads is a little bit bit more dominant and so when you squint your eyes you can see one of them is slightly more light yellow green the other one is a little bit more blue and it's because of the set everything else is the same it's just the set it's the density of those yarns being packed together so yeah, this is just more warp faced and that's why the color is more predominant. Just an interesting, interesting observation. Um, but if you do want to try this exercise as well, uh, I encourage you to try weaving a twill gamp. It's really, really very cool. And so she's going to try a number of other tests as well. And then she's going to see which one she prefers and then make dish towels out of that. Really lovely in A2 cotton. Now these are Catherine's half drill towels. They are stunning. You need to follow, <laughs> you need to follow her um, thread here for the color experiments because she goes into detail and Catherine explains what she did for each towel, what she was trying to play with, what color she was trying to mix and combine. It's a phenomenal thread to follow all of these sort of color changes and they're absolutely beautiful. This photo is of her finishing of the hems because she had some questions about, well, how should we finish hems? How should we finish them? Um, she said she's not really happy with how they turn out, um, but these hems are 
beautiful. But like when you make a dish towel and you're weaving with say a two cotton, um, what do you need to do in order to make those hems something that you can fold and then fold again before you sew down? Um, I believe I've talked to Laura Fry before. She likes to hand sew her hems. I do everything super quick. <laughs> so I machine sew the hems because I'm, it's just me using them. And, but these are beautifully beautifully hemmed. And so there's a whole conversation here. L Laura created a photo tutorial in the forums um, showing step by step how she hems her towels. And so there's conversation about like using a finer weft thread in order to create a fabric that's a little bit thinner, easier to fold, so that way it doesn't build up so much thickness when you fold it into the hems. Um, but yeah, Laura gives fantastic photo tutorial here. Um, there is also a conversation in um, the weaving twill blankets section uh, from that weaving twills on four shafts class where we take the blanket and then we fold up the hem at the end and how we go about sewing it down using a sewing machine. So there's that little video as well. And if you want to try weaving this pattern, this is actually a free pattern that is available from Gist Yarn. So if you go to their website, the towels, the PDF pattern is free. And it just uses 8-2 cotton for the warp. And then it uses Gist Duet for the weft. But you could use anything. So in this case, I think um, Catherine was using a bunch of there might be some duet in there, but I believe she was using up leftovers of different colors that she had lying around. And so there's just a lot of color play. This is a fantastic pattern for playing with color. I know I've woven these same towels as well, and just the palette that I chose was completely different. And then I know like Rachel, um, Rachel Smith has also woven these towels. Again, her color choice is completely different, but there's so many opportunities for these colors to overlap and mix and blend in different concentrations. And so the effect is just so cool. I can't get over how pretty these towels are. So I encourage you guys to check out all of these different links. There's lots and lots of wonderful things happening there. And then we have a beautiful cabin blanket here. So Sue has woven the cabin blanket from our double weave course. Uh, this one, she said she used superwash sock yarn from Knit Picks called Hawthorne. And so there's a bunch of different colors. Um, you can follow, again, her thread here. And it shows work in progress. It shows before washing, after washing, all of this kind of stuff. And um, so what she did was she was using a 45 inch wide Nihilus to Leclerc loom. And so because she had more width, because my, my project was on a 26 inch wide loom. I did mine on the baby wolf. So I was constrained by the width of my loom. If you have a bigger loom, you can make a much bigger double wide blanket. And so she expanded all of the sections from four inches to five inches to make this this beautiful blanket. Um, yeah, and so she was very lucky. She said, I was pleasant, pleasantly surprised when taking the blanket off the loom that there weren't many floats. So that is fantastic. Um, so you can follow her thread here. The double weave class is here as well. Um, and so there's a question Lauren's asking, can this be converted to a rigid heddle? And so, yes, in theory, exactly what Vicky said. <laughs> In theory, it can be. And so this is one of the things that Amanda is going to be helping us uh, learn when she comes to film next week. So it's about using two heddles on a rigid heddle loom in order to create two layers of plain weave cloth at the same time. Um, and then, you know, whatever you want to do with those two, uh, two pieces of fabric, you can do you you want to join them on two sides and make a tube you want to join them on one side and make a folded cloth you can do that as well oh lauren's saying i mean tea towels of course you can make this into tea towels for sure um very very simple sort of construction i don't know if you want to make double wide tea towels you could probably make double wide tea towels if you like but it is um plain weave weave structure and we were just using double weave to make a double width version of these blankets so absolutely now let's look at this one. This is our last project for today. This is Catherine's double weave project. So Catherine, who did the half drill towels from before, this is her double width blanket project. Now, if you follow her 
thread here, double weave blanket journey, what she did is actually take the double weave project, which is a double weave, uh, double width blanket. And instead of weaving it plain weave, she wove it in a twill pattern. And so in order to create the twill pattern, you can follow her thread here and she shows how she changed the tie up, how she changed the threading, how she created this blanket um, in an eight shaft version of the blanket in order to do the twill. You can also see that there's colors. These are the, all the gradient colors here. Those are all the warp threads. And then this sort of gray blue color is the weft. So it's one common weft, but uh, all of the warp colors are completely different because what she did was she pulled out all of her sock yarns and arranged them in rum, rainbow color order. It's amazing. The rainbow color order for all of her sock yarn leftovers. Um, and then she wound her warp with all of these, threaded the two layers, um, and then changed the tie up, changed the threading, all this kind of stuff in order to create this double width project. So there's a, f it's, this looks epic. It is epic. <laughs> there's a photo of it here finished. She was saying that it was difficult to photograph, but she was trying to get one a uh, photo where you could see the progression of the rainbow. Um, and then all of these fringes were twisted by hand using a little fringe twister. Absolutely epic, beautiful, amazing to be able to use up all of those sock yarn leftovers. I think it's fantastic. So congratulations on that. And so this is like where I'm just so excited to see everybody taking their patterns, things that they've learned in these classes and just creating something completely new out of it. Just like, what's the next step? Where can you take these things? What else can you do? Um, and um, yeah, it's fantastic. So just catching up with the chat, just tells are the same thing, a four shaft pattern. So you can convert it to rigid heddle. Yes. Um, Juliet, you bought a backstrap loom from Thailand. Ah, yes. There's so many things to learn. Be interested to hear about your trip in the Discord or in the forums, Juliet. Would love to see what textile things you learned when you went to Thailand. Fantastic. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to pop them in the chat and then we can talk about them now. Um, in the meantime, there is also, we also have a link to our giveaway. We always do a well, we sometimes, we mostly do a giveaway <laughs> every month. And so if you join the giveaway um, at that link, it's schoolofsweetgeorgia.com slash live 2023 MAR. Um, we leave it open for about 24 hours and then we will draw a winner for a $25 gift certificate to this, the shop for Sweet Georgia. <laughs> So you guys can join us there. And it just gives us an idea of how you like these live sessions. If anything was useful, what you might put in practice, all of that kind of stuff. But I also do encourage you guys to go and do the member survey. If you have not yet done the survey, please, please, please do the member survey. All of that information really does help us plan for what we're going to be doing um, for the rest of this year, the next year, and into the future. It's very much um, something that we rely on. So thank you guys so much for being here. Please do feel free to ask questions in the forum or in Discord or here. Um, it's really, really wonderful to see everybody uh, here in the chat as well. Um, I am interested actually, because I'm going to clean the studio and I will take a nice photo <laughs> once it's all arranged and beautiful. Maybe I'll take some before and after photos as well. Um, and just would love to see how you guys have your spaces set up right now as well. I've been looking for some inspiration on setting up the studio space, um, not just for weaving, but also for knitting. There's some knitting machines that are coming to the studio. There's just going to be some things moving around. <laughs> so excited to see about what you guys are working on this spring as well. Thank you guys so much for being here. I will see you guys next month. And in the meantime, I will see you guys inside the forums. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye for now.